Amen. All right. Psalm 91. We're going to start, uh, just dig right into the chapter here in verse number one. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. And this first portion of the scripture here is similar to things that we've read before about as far as just um, dwelling with God and putting your trust in the Almighty. And we're going to see multiple uh, ways that God can protect you when you seek him and, and have your dwelling place with the Lord. The Bible says in verse number three, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And, uh, you know, a snare is just a trap. And this is um, obvious. It's interesting here if we just kind of look at this and, you know, it says you're delivered from the snare of the fowler. So, Oftentimes, when you, when you, you know, when you make the Lord that, you know, your habitation, um, you know, you kind of think about a lot of things. What does that mean? Well, I take that to mean your, your proximity, your closeness to the Lord. And, and how do we accomplish being close to the Lord? It's more than just showing up to church, right? Uh, I preach on Sunday, this is the house of God. But, but dwelling with God is, is where you dwell, is where you make your home. It's not just um, going to the house of God. It's, it's, it's your living, it's your being. So uh, if we're going to think about dwelling with the Lord and, and being with Him, it's kind of on the regular. So what that tells me, it's going to be people who are reading His Word continually and, and having that communion with God regularly and praying to God regularly and, and having that good relationship and having that closeness with the Lord with, you know, getting sins out of your life and, and sanctifying yourself more and, and just having good fellowship with the Lord is a way that you are going to achieve having that, that you know, where you could say like, like, well, the Lord is my dwelling place. I, I'm going to stay with him. And we know from the wisdom of God's word that God's word warns us about a lot of uh traps about a lot of snares. I could say in here, a snare is a trap, right? So someone who's hunting is going to set a snare. They're going to set a trap for an animal, for a bird, you know, for usually for, for little game. And um, the, the animals will, will get, they, they set them up, excuse me. They'll set up the traps so that the animals can't see them, right? They try to, to camouflage it a little bit and make everything look pretty normal, put some leaves around it, whatever, and whatever string, whatever trap, however they set it, is going to be disguised to look like it's fine. And then, of course, the animal springs a trap, and then they get what? They get stuck. And there are plenty of traps in life, sinful traps that can uh, snare you, that can entrap you, that can get you stuck, that they, they can hurt you, that can damage you, you know. That, but, but being in the Word of God will help to warn you, Right? Uh, what well, the Bible gives a lot of warnings, for example, in the book of Proverbs about, um, about the, the, the adulterous woman, for, just for, as one example, right? And it gives all these different characteristics and all these different warning signs and all the, the damage that comes as a result. And, you know, it, it tells you, it talks about the simple ones, right? Oh, you know, I saw the simple one and he passed by her way and, and, and all the things that he did that was foolish, and all the warning signs and all the, all the things that you need to be able to look for to keep you from the snare. And the Bible says here, you know, I mean, hey, you're, you're making the Lord a dwelling place. He's going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. So what's a pestilence is a disease. And, you know, if you think even just along those similar sin, you know, the trap of fornication, the trap of adultery, what goes hand in hand with that oftentimes is pestilence. STDs, you know, these, these diseases that, that go along with that type of a sin. Similar with, with different drug use and things like that, right? These, these are all th things that can happen to you, but it doesn't have to happen to you. If you're making your dwelling place with the Lord and you're in his word, you're going to have a lot of wisdom to be able to avoid those things. And quite honestly, people get into those sins. Like we all have the flesh. But when you don't have good knowledge and good understanding and good warnings and good, you know, and, and seeing the end of those things before you ever get into them, oftentimes people just, just because of their ignorance will get involved with a lot of those sins. You know, people who don't have 
any uh, upbringing with church at all, with the word of God at all. Uh, and, and maybe if they don't see the, the experiences firsthand in their own life either, it's easy to get sucked into a lot of these things and they're just foolish. They're living for the moment. They're living for the day. They don't see the end result. Well, the word of God will teach you otherwise and will keep you from these things for sure. Verse number four, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And look, we don't need to be ashamed or afraid to speak the truth from the word of God. Because it's, it's not something that's going to bring you damage. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's supposed to be your shield and your defense. So God's truth is a defense for you. It's a shield for you. Not something to be embarrassed of. Not something that you think, oh, well, if I speak the truth, then it's going to come bad on me. No, that's, that's actually your shield. That's your defense. Don't, don't, don't look at it in the world's light. Don't look at it through Satan's goggles because he's going to try to make you see it as a way that's going to be bad for you if you're known as someone who loves the Bible or loves God's word or stands on the truth. Take it from God's, <laughs> from God's word. He is your uh, shield and your buckler and his truth will do that for you. Uh, it is a defense. Knowing the truth is a defense for you. Verse number five, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. We have no reason to be afraid. You have no reason to fear. You don't have to fear what man can do unto you. You don't have to fear what, what people can do unto you. You don't have to be afraid of things in the night. You don't have to be afraid of even you know, the arrow by day. Anything that's going to try to cause you damage, we don't have to be afraid of those things. We have the Lord as our defense. Again, verse number six. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. And verses five and six kind of go hand in hand, and they both bring up the daytime or the nighttime. Any time of day, it doesn't matter, right? People have a tendency to get more fearful at night, but it doesn't matter if there's, if there's rioting in the daytime or if there's threats at night. We don't need to worry about that. We don't need to be afraid of those things, especially when we are making our dwelling place with the Lord. And you know what? Maybe, you know, you live in, a, in an area where, where it is kind of sketchy. We don't have to walk in fear. Now, I think we should walk in wisdom, just like Proverbs talks about, you know, the simple one going the wrong way and kind of heading down, you know, it's going to entice them into other sin and stuff. The same way, we should use good judgment to not put ourselves into situations and into areas where it may not be that safe for us to walk. But I'll tell you what, no matter what, where we are and what we do, we don't have to be afraid. So if we're walking with the Lord, God is going to be our defense. And, and of course, especially if you're walking with the Lord and doing the Lord's work, right? So many of the areas that you might not want to just go into for no reason if you're going into those areas with the Bible and you're preaching Jesus Christ, well, then you have nothing to fear and we ought to go and, and, and do those things and not, ha and not be afraid of what can happen unto you because um, that you're fulfilling the will of God for certain. And the Bible says this in verse number seven, you know, after all of these great um, truths, right, of, of God's goodness and God's protection and, and the reason not to fear, the Bible says this in verse 7, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Simple verse, but what a great promise. I mean, even when you have a thousand, I mean, I think a thousand people is a lot of people falling at your side. Like, they're all suffering of these things, of the snares of the pestilences, of the arrow, of, you know, whatever, all these bad things that can happen, be saying it's not going to come nigh you. It's not going to come close to you, even though they're at your side, or 10,000 at thy right hand. That's a lot. Right? A, obviously, poetic language, of course, right? But, but it's, it's, it's putting that, that message across, you know, 1,000 at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. It doesn't matter. They can all go down in flames, as it were, but if you're with God and you've made your habitation with the Lord, he can keep you safe and just not even come nigh unto you. We see similar promises to this elsewhere in Scripture. 
Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. The first thing that popped into my head was Psalm 91 in that verse number 7 is, or, and, and the verses leading up to number 7, is that famous uh, Psalm 23. In verse number 4, the Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right? For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And we, we could, you know, no matter how dire the situation, you're walking through the valley of death. You get people falling on your left hand and on your right hand, literally walking over dead, passing over dead, and you don't have to fear at all because God's with you. And that's, that's powerful, right? I mean, if you, if you really just stop and think about it for a second, someone just, just literally losing their life right by you, right next to you, and you don't die, and you continue on, and it doesn't even um, come close to you in a sense that it's, it's not going to touch you, right? Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 4, the Bible reads this. This is another uh, kind of an application of the same truth that's being delivered in Psalm 91. Verse number four says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Of course, Second Peter chapter 2 talks a lot about the false prophet and it talks about these reprobates. But one of the things that we can take from this passage that we just read here is about God knowing how to deliver the godly out of temptations. He knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished just as much as he's able to deliver the righteous out of of that, out of that punishment, out of that situation. He did that with Noah, right? The whole world's given over to wickedness. And if you just apply Psalm 91, hey, a thousand shall fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Noah and his family, they were safe on the ark. But I mean, how many thousands of people were destroyed in the flood? I mean, we don't, we don't know the answer to that, but it had to be a lot. I mean, a lot of people died in that flood. And, and you know what? They weren't ready for it. They weren't prepared. They were, you know, generally speaking, just kind of given over to this wickedness and unrighteousness and not living, not, not abiding with the Lord, not uh, close with God. And you know what? They fell. And, and they fell all in one day. And, and similarly with Lot, right? Lot was a saved man. Lot was a righteous man living in a wicked city, in a wicked town. And, uh, of course, we know the destruction that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about. And, but what, what did God do? God delivered him out of that. And he wasn't, he wasn't injured at all. He wasn't scathed. You know, God rained fire and brimstone down, and not one hair of his head perished when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. God made sure he was safe before that judgment came down. But there was judgment coming down all around him, yet he was safe. And this is uh, sure promises of the Lord and something we should take a lot of comfort in. Look at verse number 8 there, back in Psalm 91. The Bible says, Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And, you know, after what we just read there, obviously we can see that Lot saw with his eyes the destruction of, of those cities. Abraham saw with his eyes that destruction too, but um, it didn't come to him. And history says it's only with thine eyes. So he's not going to feel or be part of it, but he's going to see it with his eyes. And he sees the destruction come upon the wicked. And you know what? All of the righteous will see the destruction of the wicked at some point in the future also. When, when people are cast into the lake of fire, um, we'll see it with our eyes. We'll see the the just reward that's given unto the wicked. Verse number nine, because thou hast made 
the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. You saying this is why? Because you made God your habitation. Everything we're reading, first, you know, eight, eight verses, first seven verses, excuse me. You've made the Lord your habitation. You've made it, you made, you've been dwelling with the Lord. So that's why you're going to walk with him. He'll protect you. He's your shield. And you'll see the reward of the wicked befall them. There shall no evil befall thee, verse number 10. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And then he makes this promise as well in verse number 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And this is where he's talking about the guardian angels, his angels that are, that are given a charge to protect. Now, we see in the New Testament, if you want to, you could turn to Matthew chapter 4, that the devil applies this to Jesus Christ. And this does apply to Jesus Christ, but I don't read Psalm 91 as something that's only about Jesus Christ. It, it, there, there's not enough there to make this only a prophecy of Christ. Don't forget, it's the devil that's making the application. So it's not, it's not uh, the Holy Ghost who's opening this up. It's not what we see in other passages where there's fulfillments of Scripture and things like that that are clear. This is Satan trying to tempt Jesus with Scripture. So again, I'm not saying Psalm 91 doesn't apply to Christ. But I don't read Psalm 91 as a prophecy like of Christ or for Christ. With, because when you, when you read statements like um, in verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. I mean, you have a couple of people here already talking about making God your habitation, right? You've made him your habitation, just like I've made him my habitation, right? So he's going to protect you. And of course, he's going to protect me. And these promises that we see being made in Psalm 91 are applicable to anyone who's going to make the Lord their habitation, right? So of course that applies to Christ. He had God's protection. He was perfect in all of his ways. So absolutely it applies to him. But this isn't the same as other Psalms that we see are literal prophecies of the coming Christ that are like only applied to Christ, if that makes sense, right? So I don't see this here. However, um, we do see Satan quoting this, or trying to quote this passage. Uh, we're going to look at this in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, it's, only, it's, it's the only place we're going to look at. It's another, I think it's in Luke as well. Um, but we're going to read in verse number five there. The Bible says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on, the, on a pinnacle of the temple. So he's just... Obviously, what's, what's happening here is it's a supernatural event, right? Because the devil is like able to just kind of take him and bring him up to, to this, this high point, this top point on top of the temple. And... Uh, Verse 6 says, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, I want to I point out a couple things here with what Satan's doing. One of the things that I noticed uh, right away is that Satan removes from and adds to the Word of God in his quote of Scripture. Now, I want to be clear about this because I brought up verses in the past where we can see that the quotes and, and things referenced from the New Testament and the Old Testament aren't always identical to the, you know, like to the Word, but they mean the same things. But what we see here are, are whole phrases removed and whole phrases added, which we don't really see that in the direct quotes there's references in the Old Testament to, to the Old Testament from the New Testament that you'll see. And look, this is kind of a deep subject and it requires a lot of time to go into. I'm just kind of cover it on the surface level. But just so you understand, there's references to the Old Testament that aren't necessarily always a direct quote. Right? You can talk about things. People can reference them and say them the same way that we might reference an old, you know, any type of Bible quote without quoting it verbatim word for word. People can do that in the scripture as well. You don't have to look at that and be like, oh man, I'm all freaked out because this didn't match up perfectly. 
right? But then there's also the translation aspect of people in Greek, they're speaking in Greek and they're quoting Hebrew. So it's the same meaning, it's, it's even the same, you know, it's, it's, it's all the same understanding, but the translation, it's a different word in English that we're reading because not only were they quoting, you know, a Hebrew verse in Greek, then we're getting that translated in English. Nothing is lost in the translation, but you can see some slightly different words being used that mean exactly the same thing. And that is also done, I believe, to show us that while every word matters, there's, there's what is the level of precision that God had intended on preserving his word and making it you know, still considered to be his word throughout the ages between different languages. So it's what is that exact precision? Well, it's not to the, to the uh, you know, capital letter or the spelling or the, you know what I mean? Like, like there, there's all these different levels of precision. So I don't want to get into all that details, but I'm throwing it out there just for your thought and for your consideration, right? Because it is, it, is, it ends up being a complicated issue when you really start digging into and looking at every single aspect of uh, the preservation of God's word. But here I want to point out just a couple of things that Satan does, because the Bible tells us that, there, that, that he's a father of all lies and that there is no truth in him. Amen. Now, if he quotes scripture, I could just say this, that truth isn't in him. <laughs> right? this, if he's quoting scripture, that, that truth didn't come from him. But I also notice that when Satan even tries to say what God said, that he always, I think, intentionally twists it or says it a little bit wrong or says it different, right? Just going all the way back to Adam and Eve. And of course, the application of the scripture is completely wrong the way he's trying to tempt Jesus. So right off the bat, that clearly is wrong. But even his quotation, if you just want to look at this um, in Psalm 91, what we see in, uh, in Matthew 4, he removed... The phrase, so in Psalm 91, 11, the Bible reads, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And that last phrase, to keep thee in all thy ways, he did not quote in, uh, in Matthew 4. He says, um, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And that's it. Not, not to keep thee in all thy ways. Because that kind of helps with the application of the passage, right? So, so let's, let's remove that because he's trying to tempt him to just put himself into this excess danger that's completely unwarranted and no one would ever do that unless you're literally just trying to test God. You're trying to tempt him. Like, no, we don't, we don't, we don't do that, right? We have faith in God's word, but we're not going to say like, well, I'm going to go and, and just do something really foolish and dangerous just, just to prove a point or just a test. Well, no, is God really going to, you know, And then this, it says, uh, so from Psalm 91, 12, it says, They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And he added, uh, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So uh, the at, at any time isn't, isn't in Psalm 91 either. So we see him adding and removing to the word of God. And of course, the way that Satan is writing this is like, well, hey, just jump off a cliff because the Bible says that, you know, the angels are there to make sure you don't even uh, hit your foot on a stone. But that's not the point of that passage. It's to keep you in all your ways. And what would your ways be? The ways of following the Lord and doing what he would have you to do. Right. So if you're if you're following God, if you're doing what he has for you to do, of course, he's going to look out for you and protect you which is consistent with all the rest of Scripture and all the rest of these promises that we read over and over and over again. We read them through the book of Psalms. We saw the other examples uh, that we already looked at in the New Testament. And there's others as well that tell you the same thing. Follow the word of God and he will keep you in your way and in your path. And also, um, turn if you would to Mark 16. I would say it's, it's a similar thing with that. I'll read for you from Psalm 91, verse 13. 
But the point of, of this scripture in Psalm 91 is not to say, yeah, go, go jump out of an airplane without a parachute. You know, I mean, God's, you're, you're, you're righteous with the Lord, so God's just going to make sure that you don't, your foot doesn't hit a stone. Like, no, that's stupid. There's no reason to do anything like that. That's tempting the Lord. We don't do those types of things. Now, Psalm 91 continues, right? So we have that famous passage. It's quoted famously, at least. We, I think a lot of people remember that because it's, it's early in the New Testament. Jesus is out in the desert. He's being tempted of the devil. And, and this is one of the ways in which the devil tempts Jesus. And he tries to use God's word against him. And you know what? That's another thing. Just be aware of that. That just because someone's using the word of God, right, or is pointing to the Bible or saying, oh, you should do this because of the Bible, or you should do that because of the Bible, you can't just believe every spirit, right? The Bible says to try the spirits, whether they be of God. Right? You can't just, you can't trust Satan, <laughs> obviously, when he's telling you to do something. And of course, Jesus knows this, but it's not always as obvious for us. The Bible says that, that Satan is, is an angel of light. And his ministers, his, the other the devils, the other devils are like that too. Other fallen angels, they're going to appear to you as an angel of light. They're going to appear to you as someone who's good. They might speak the right things or say the you know some of the, the the things that sound right. I should say not the right things, but the things that sound right. They might look right. They have a good appearance. They look uh, clean. They look like they're a good person or whatever. But what they're really bringing is damnation and destruction. So we need to have the knowledge from the Word of God to protect us from that. And, I mean, you can say, well, hey, you know, the Bible says this, so that's okay. I mean, it's the people, oh, the Bible says, you know, to, to have a little wine for some sake, so drinking booze is okay. Right? You got, and you got to be careful with, with all of that. There's plenty of people who will try to use the Scripture. I mean, these days, they're trying... They're trying to make the Bible say things about like all the queers and stuff that it's, oh, it's fine, it's normal, there's nothing wrong with that. Look, the Bible says it. Like, obviously, they're way off base. Okay, you, you, you don't need very much knowledge from the Bible even to, to see through that. At least, in my opinion, I don't think you need that. Like, it's pretty self evident how, how bad some of these people try to get with it. But not everything is that self evident. Right? Not every uh, false doctrine, not every piece of bad advice where people are trying to use the Bible and tell you, oh, no, yeah, go ahead and do this. And, and notice with the devil, you know, that there's so many things to learn from that. I'm not, I wasn't planning on getting this in depth in it, but it's such a great, it's a great piece of truth for our understanding. Uh, when did Satan attack Jesus? When he was already physically kind of weakened from fasting in the desert for 40 days, right? So he's, he's out, he's alone, he's on his journey, he's doing his thing, fasting, out in the desert, by himself, and then here comes Satan to tempt him. Oh, I see, I see you're kind of hungry, right? Why don't you, why don't you turn this, uh, this stone into, into bread and eat? I mean, you're a son of God, I mean, come on, prove it. Right? And using all kinds of ways to, to just get him to, to, to sin, to do something that he shouldn't be doing. Here it's like, oh yeah, prove you're a son of God. Well, just, you can just jump off this pinnacle right now and, and you'll be just fine because angels will, will scoop you up and protect you. Right? And, and all these different things. And it's like, look, that's not, that's not what the Bible's saying as far as, you know, and even I would say this, you know, people will tell you, this is a good example, in my opinion, will say like, well, don't get any medical care on anything and all you do is just pray. And I disagree with that. I think the first thing we should do is pray and we should always pray and we continue to pray. We have a prayer list. We pray for people because prayer works 100%. And this doesn't take away from God at all. But as with so many other truths in Scripture, God still expects us to do what we can in, in all of the areas that we that we can. I mean, everything that we can do, whether it be our own, our own health needs, whether it be finding employment, whether it be any, you know, you don't just, you don't just sit and pray and then just do nothing else, right? We don't just sit and pray for people to get saved. We're going to go out and do the work. We don't just sit and pray, God, just give me a, a job, but then you don't go out and apply for jobs. And you know, you don't just pray like God just heal me without trying to also do what you can to the best of your knowledge and ability to, to, to get healing, right? I mean, these are all areas where 
Yes, you absolutely have the 100% faith. And even just with defense, right? The Bible t is clear about, hey, the Lord is our defense. The Lord is our shield. The Lord is our buckler. We trust in him. You know, there, there's, you know, regardless of how many enemies there are, God can save, God can deliver. We just need to put our faith in him. At the same time, Jesus said, hey, sell your garment and buy a sword. Right? It doesn't mean stop having faith in God. It means, no, always have the faith in God. But also, hey, you know what's wise? You know what also makes sense? You know what you ought to be doing too? Be able to defend yourself, right? Just be, be prepared, be ready. So, and, and people love to, to yank verses out of context to try to push something that is false and try to push something that, that, that just isn't true that can have really bad effects on your life. I mean, the people who like to isolate themselves and not receive any type of care for their children, you know, like medical things were, were, and look, I'm not saying I think that all medical treatments of modern day science is like even good for you, okay? I'm not saying that. There's obviously all kinds of different scenarios where the treatments may not be good at all. It's not an, a, a blanket endorsement of every single Western medical treatment that exists on this planet. I'm not saying that. But there's some people who won't get any treatment and just will isolate and, and just say, nope, this is all we're going to do. And I think that's wrong too. And some people try to point to the Bible and say, like, like, nope, no, it says this. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for that. Right? No blood transfusions at all. Nothing, you can't do that at all. It's against the religion. And it's like, well, people die because of that, that otherwise could live. So, it, I mean, it, it matters a lot. And this is why we need to have good communion with the Lord, where we're in his word, we're seeking his guidance, seeking his direction, right? Seeking the wisdom and understanding and praying as well. Now, Psalm 91, 11 and 12, of course, his angels, uh, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands. You're still in Mark 16. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So these are those verses of protection. And then verse 13 says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and dragon shalt thou trample under feet. So continuing on from the guardian angels protecting you, he's saying, not only that, but you're going to tread upon the lion and the adder. An adder is a snake. It's a serpent. Okay. Uh, in, in case you didn't know that, the young lion and the dragon. And oftentimes serpents and dragons are, are used synonymously or, or very similarly, which is the case here. Shalt thou trample under feet. And we see a very similar promise in Mark 16. At the end of Mark 16, verse 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, again, the, the, the devil's application of specifically in their verse 18 deceives people. And there are people deceived in Georgia today. They're called the snake handlers, right? And they say, oh, no, no, look, we believe the Bible here. It says right here that you're going to take up serpents. And you're not going to feel no hurt. You're not going to have any harm. Look, look, this is, that's exactly what Satan wants you to think that you need to do to prove your faith. He was saying the same thing to Jesus to jump off the temple. What did Jesus say? Don't tempt God. You, you know, this promise is here. It's not for you to be like, oh, oh I'm just going to start picking up snakes now. See, like you can bite me, ah, and, and, and try to tease it to get you to bite you. Like, like, that's stupid. It's foolishness. That's not the point of this passage at all. And we see, we see, if, you know, for those that read their Bible, you see the examples spelled out of these truths coming to pass. You see the Apostle Paul when he's shipwrecked. You see him when he's going to throw the faggot into the fire, the bundle of sticks, right? It's, you don't know what a faggot is? It's a bundle of sticks. He threw a bundle of sticks in the fire, and the serpent bit him on the hand, right? And then the locals there, they thought that he was going to fall over dead. 
because he, he had a, obviously he was a venomous serpent that bit him, but he felt no hurt and he was fine. Why? Because of this promise right here. Because what is he doing? He is standing on the word of God. He's being persecuted for the word of God. He's arrested for the word of God. And he's going to continue to preach the word of God. So God is keeping him in his ways. As he's preaching, God, you know, it's like, look, you're going to take up serpents. And look, even if he were to drink some deadly thing, it's not going to hurt him. And again, this isn't talking about disciples going, hey, let's drink some hemlock. <laughs> See, isn't that a cool trick? We go out to the bars and we'll make some money. We'll, we'll show people how we can drink deadly things and it's not going to kill us and take bets on who, you know, like. <laughs> no, you would die if you went to try to do that. Right? That's stupid. So what's it talking about? Oh, drinking deadly things. Because if you're traveling, especially, that, you know, like you're on foot or you're going around and you need some water and maybe the water is polluted. Maybe there's some bacteria. Maybe there's some disease or something. You know, God will make it so that you're still sustained through those things and that he'll still keep you alive, even in situations where you would normally die, like getting some venomous snake bite you. He's like, no, you'll still be okay. Why? Because God is there for you. And, and I think this is also interesting how Psalm 91 and Mark 16 both, they bring up serpents, right? So there's the, there's the physical aspect, of course, which we see play out in the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul of literally just being uh, uh, fine and, and, and not having any damage come to him. But there's all, you, you can't help but see, especially in Psalm 91, when it references the dragon and the young lion being trampled under feet. This is, I would say, clearly talking about more than just physically being able to trample young lions and snakes, right, dragons. This is the enemy. This is the opposition. This is Satan. This is, hey, God will be with you. God will make sure you're not going to have any injury fall you, but you'll also get the victory over the devil. You also have the victory over those that hate the Lord. And that, and that God can bring that to you as long as you just, hey, stay with him. Keep your habitation with the Lord. Because the devil is more powerful than us. He is a, a, a being of more might and power than we have, which is why we need to stay with Christ and with God, who has more power than anyone. If God be for us, who could be against us? The Bible says this, and, and it turn if you would to, to Romans 16. James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a promise of, of, of God giving you the victory over the devil. Hey, resist him. How are you going to resist? Steadfast in the truth of God's word. Don't fall for his temptations. Don't fall for the twisting of scripture. Don't fall for any of the attacks, the subtle attacks of Satan to try to get you to fall. Just resist. resist. Don't partake. You know, don't partake of the forbidden fruit, Eve. <laughs> resist. He'll leave you alone. Now, it's a little late for that now, but you know what I'm saying. Romans 16, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And, and simple means you don't know that much. Like he's like, I want you just to know the good. You don't have to know the evil. And, and this in itself, and I wasn't planning on preaching this at all, but since it's right here, I might as well just bring it up. You know, you don't have to study every false way in order to reach people with, from the false way. You don't have to know that. You don't. Uh, there's a lot of people who think, well, I need to know everything about this evilness and this wickedness. I need to know all about this stuff in order to reach or help people. You don't. You know why? Because all, the more you know about what's good and what's right and what's true, that's what everybody needs to know. It's better not to know the depths of Satan. It's better not to know all of the, all of the ways in which people can just get really depraved and, and, and low. Like, no, no, you don't have to, because you're, you're not reaching them with that. You don't have to have the same experience as them to reach people. You just have to have the truth. 
Like this is what you need, what you need is the truth and the more you know the truth, the better you can help people with the truth. You know it inside and out, you're going to be able to explain it to people in a way they can understand and, and here you go. I mean, it's the same way of, of fi you know, finding counterfeit bills. You don't, you don't study all of the counterfeits out there, you just study the real thing. And that's how you spot the false way. Study the right way, study God's way, study the word of God, get that in your mind, get that in your heart, and then it becomes easier to spot all the false ways. It's easier to spot the, the temptations of the devil and the distractions and the false doctrines because no, 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 no. What you're saying there, I know you're using this verse, but the Bible says here, here, and here that that, that can't be true. You see what I'm saying? Because the more you know the right way, it's a good defense against the wrong way. But the verse I was trying to get to here is verse number 20. It says, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Uh, similar promise, right? You do what's right. I want you to be uh, wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. And you know what? You stay with God. You go the right way. And God's going to bruise Satan under your feet. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Stay with God. The Bible says this in, uh, turn if you go to Luke 22. I mean, what great encouragement from Psalm 91 about trampling the dragon under your feet. And the reason why it's such a big comfort is because of what a fear it could be to think of Satan coming after you. I mean, that is, that is, that is something to, to think about, right? Like, well, man, you know, if I, if I decide to live for God, that means Satan's going to be coming after me. We need that comfort to know that God is going to allow you to trample the devil on your foot. Because as I mentioned before, you know, let's not be haughty like some of the Pentecostals are of, of saying, oh man, I'm, you know, like I'm going to call out the devil and I'm going to, you know, and they get like, like kind of a haughty attitude over Satan. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, like we're going to trust in God and we're going to resist the devil, but make no doubt about it. You know, he's been around for a really, really long time and is very cunning and, and, and has a lot of, of knowledge and especially about human beings. And don't think that you're more powerful than Satan is. God is more powerful. Christ is more powerful, but we are not. Okay? So we don't lose sight of that. We, we, we keep humility in Christ. We have confidence and we can have good spirits knowing that Hey, if God before us, who could be against us? Knowing that God will allow us to trample Satan underfoot, but not with this attitude of how great we are and how weak the devil is. Look, he's weak in comparison to God because everyone's weak in comparison to God. In comparison to you and me, he's not that weak, right? I mean, we, we have weak flesh. So Luke 22, verse 31 the Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And that you there is plural. He's talking about all the disciples. He said, look, Satan wants to have you. He wants to, why does he want to have you? Because he wants to sift you. He wants to rattle you. He wants to shake you up. And ultimately, he wants to destroy you. Right? Satan, Satan's after you. He's after the disciples. He's at, he, he wants them to stop doing what they're doing. But here's the good news. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Jesus prays for the individual, not just for the group. He's like, I prayed for thee. I prayed for you, Peter. I prayed for you, Brother Michael. I prayed for you, Brother Peter. I prayed for you, Brother Dakota. I prayed for you, Brother Jake. I prayed for you, Brother Will. I prayed for you, Brother Keo. I prayed for you. Hey, Satan wants to have all of us. But Jesus is like, I'm praying for you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. God will strengthen you, and you'll stay strong in your faith. And that's encouraging. Let's go back to Psalm 91. Verse number 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. And this is from God's perspective now at this point in the psalm. You know, you can go back and read the, there's, there's a lot of pronouns used in general kind of throughout this psalm, but, but you know, you set your love on me, I'm going to deliver him. 
uh, verse 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Who is this talking about, though, in general? That, those who make their habitation with the Lord. Sounds like that's something that we should be doing. Sounds like if you're not living with God at home when you leave church tonight. Sounds like if you have nothing to do with God when you're just all throughout the week. Doesn't sound like your habitation's with him. Well, these promises are for those that have their habitation with the Lord. I want these promises for me. So you know what that means? Let's try it. <laughs> being close with God and, and, and that way we know hey when we call upon him he's going to answer us hey my good and faithful servant he's, he needs something I'm going to hey my faithful son my obedient son my obedient daughter that you know oh you need something I'm here I'm answering I'll be with him in trouble I will deliver him and honor him with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a wonderful psalm. What an encouraging psalm. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this great psalm. Thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for being our helper and our defender. Lord, help us to, um, to get closer to you. Uh, stir up our hearts and our minds in our daily life. Help us not to get so distracted with all the, the cares and concerns in this world that we would uh, just allow for the thought of you and, and our service to you to just slip by us to where we're not really doing anything during the week. I pray that you please help us to, to be mindful and to stir us up so that we wouldn't forget to pray. We wouldn't forget to, to uh, read. We wouldn't forget to serve you. We wouldn't forget to, to just be a minister, dear Lord, and, and help us every day so that we can be closer to you, um, not just in our thoughts, but also in, in our words and in our deeds. God, we love you. Thank you for our church. Please, uh, please bless us all as we go our separate ways this evening. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.